Well, hi everybody. So uh, that's our topic, ATMs We Kick Their Ass. And what we're going to show you in that talk is uh, part of our experience doing pen tests and hacking ATMs. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I am C. My name is MC. And uh, I do security stuff. And uh, I'm a co founder of a company called Breakpawn uh, with Janum here. And I've spoken at some other conferences, and uh, yeah, I have a bunch of search and things like that. Used to do a lot of uh, QSA work, and uh, there you go. So I'm Yaniv Miron, uh, aka Lament, security researcher, co founder of Breakpoint with uh, MC here. Uh, found zero days in different stuff and talked in different places. Uh, that's Breakpoint, our company that we just founded. Uh, so we're doing some advanced hacking, you know, ATMs, SCADA stuff, reversing, uh, ha hardware hacking, stuff like that. Uh, and we just founded it. It's sort of international because he's from Sweden, I'm from Israel, so it's sort of globally uh, all over the world. Uh, and it's so sort of a continuation of our uh, previous job. We worked in uh, uh, labs in a previous place, and we sort of took the labs, and that's what we're doing now. So. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So just keep in mind uh, what we can't really show you actually all all the evidence from our testing, obviously because of confidentiality um, reasons. But we'll show you some cool stuff. Um, so we can't show the evidence, unfortunately. Um, so the agenda today is we're going to start with some general sort of uh, information about uh, ATMs, and then we're going to talk about uh, the sort of weaknesses that we've come across when we do our testing. And then we can talk about a bit how you, uh, uh, you know, hack ATMs and some uh, stories from our work out in the field. Uh, so what's an ATM? Well, ATM stands for automated teller machine. And uh, as you all know, you can uh, take out usually money. You can uh, do some simple uh, things uh, with your account. And in some t countries like Portugal, it's quite advanced. I'm not sure what it's like here in, uh, in Poland, having to use your ATMs here, but then, like in Portugal, they can uh, pay their bills and buy movie tickets, top up their, their mobile phone and stuff like that. And uh, <clears throat> ATMs in general, uh, they're quite old and very expensive to manage and maintain. Um, so like I said before, they're, they're quite common in, in, like in Portugal, for instance, they have like 13,000 ATMs it's on every street corner. Whereas like in Sweden, where I'm from, uh, they are, they're actually removing the ATMs in a lot of places, so it's, there's not that many ATMs left. And some of the vendors that you may uh, be familiar with from using an ATM, you'll see them here, like NCR, Debold, Vincor, and Triton, and stuff like that. Uh, here's an ATM, and uh, I'm not sure if you've seen like, crazy things like this. When they go a bit wrong, you'll see weird error messages from Windows, like here. Um, so where do you find the, the ATMs? Usually they're like inside uh, a bank or in the lobby or out on the floor like in shopping malls or convenience stores. So the terminology that's used in the industry is sort of on-premise, off-premise. And you can again find them pretty much everywhere. Um, the sort of physical architecture of an ATM, it's basically uh, you'll have a PC inside the enclosure, uh, the steel box, usually with a lock. And then there's a bunch of cash cartridges where they put the banknotes that will be dispensed through a... Uh, cash dispenser, and there's usually a little uh, printer that prints a receipt. Then in the front, you'll have a display monitor and a uh, pin pad, encrypting pin pad, where you put your, your uh, card in, and you'll uh, punch your pin pad to, to access the ATM functionality. And then if you flip it around, you'll see there's usually like an, another little display, an admin display, and at keyboards, you can uh, administer the ATM. And of course, you have the card reader. There's usually some sort of cameras and uh, sensor and various alarms. We'll talk about that later. Uh, network hardware to so it's communicate, and then uh, cables, and usually another lock on the cabinet itself. Here's uh, more like a diagram. To the left, you can actually see what, what it looks like once you open up the ATM from the back. So usually at the top there, the CPU or the computer. You see the receipt printer. To the left there is kind of where you administer the, the machine. And then at the bottom, all the cash dispensers. And to the right here, you can see sort of a more uh, a diagram showing all the various components. Um, that's kind of the, the major sort of components that you'll find inside an ATM if you open it up. So a bit about the networks. Uh, so ATMs communicate over something called EFT networks. And uh, there are controllers, sort of switches, uh, that switch the traffic between the ATMs. 
And of course, these controls are interconnected, and uh, they will eventually connect usually to some sort of mainframe at the back end, uh, at issuers and acquirers. And uh, another important thing is actually that there are, uh, of course, various sort of uh, usually networks at companies, right? They will have like an ATM testing network, a staging network, and a production network. And uh, various hosts or mainframes that it connects to. We'll come to later why that's important because that means the tax surface is actually pretty big if you want to hack stuff. Here's a little diagram that sort of explains what I talked about before. You can see ATMs up there uh, to the left. The cloud is like all the switches and, and networks that interconnect. To the right, you'll have the host or the mainframe. And then it's, um, uh, it's important to think about, we'll again speak about that later, that there are, of course, all kinds of job roles that connect to manage these various components. So if, you, if you want to hack an ATM, you may not necessarily target the ATM itself. You'll actually target some of these job roles that uh, manage or work with the ATM. Uh, Something about the OS that runs on an ATM, it's usually win some sort of uh, flavor of Windows. So XP, there's something called XP Embedded. That's like a stripped down version of XP. A lot of banks are migrating to se Windows 7 right now. And then you you'll still come across really old school stuff like 2000 NT, even CE sometimes. And then there's some Linux variants also, uh, which are not that common from what we've tested. And uh, moving up in the application layer, there's something called F XFS. That's sort of the platform that, that's used. So together with the, the Windows uh, OS, uh, that's what they call the programmable application. So remember I mentioned where it's a bit more uh, complex functionality, where you can buy tickets and stuff like that. That's what they would call a programmable application. So that's the Windows OS plus XFS. And then there's different sort of t uh, variants of the XFS. So there's like usually some sort of middleware to tie it all together. And uh, yeah. Um, so looking at some, some of the sort of hardening that they do to sort of protect the ATM itself, uh, of course, like I said, there's a bunch of locks and steel cages to make it harder to, to sort of break in. And you should la they'll have some sort of a mechanism. So if you try to, to get money out of there, sort of break it out by brute force, uh, it will actually spray like ink on the notes. And uh, something we haven't seen, actually, the one we tested, but allegedly there are like uh, sort of gas explosion sensors that will suppress uh, if someone is trying to blow up the ATM with a, with a gas bomb or something, will actually sense that uh, it's about to happen and, and sort of release a chemical agent, but we haven't seen those. So. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, to, uh, there's an encrypting pin pad that we talked about. That's to protect uh, the, your pin and sort of the transaction data. And then you have these, uh, like I said before, various alarms and sensors. So they can sense like sometimes temperature, if the ATM is tilted or if it's opened or vibrated. It will sort of uh, sense that and, and do various things. And then, of course, you have like anti-skimming mechanisms. And then usually there's uh, all kinds of uh, monitoring of the ATM itself for sort of suspicious behavior. And uh, of course, when we test these things, this sounds nice that they have all this stuff, but usually it's pretty broken on all kinds of levels. So we'll talk more about that level later. Yeah, so uh, the logical part. So now we know how the ATM is built in a physical way. Now we need to go to the logical so we know how it's built. We know the OS. Now we need to know what's on top of the OS. So from our experience, there is very old stuff there, like uh, Movie Maker, uh, which is very exploitable, like Adobe Reader, but very old versions, like 5 or something like that. Uh, of course, broken and out-of-date anti-malware. And what we're meaning by that is that, let's say there is an antivirus in there. It could be that they're updating the signatures, but they will not update the engine. So the antivirus engine is like, I don't know, from 2005 or something with some signature updates, but the engine is so bad that it will not catch almost, you know, it will skip most of the uh, new stuff. Uh, and of course, weak hardening, uh, which allows you to make a pretty easy privilege escalation. So, you know, hardening, there's uh, usually on desktops, you'll have, uh, you cannot plug USB, you cannot enter CD, you cannot open CMD, stuff like that. In ATM, it seems that everything is open in most of the ATMs that we saw. So we can party like 1999, because that's a security level. Uh, so, as we said, also the boot options are not secured. So I would expect in an ATM, you know, to prevent me from booting whatever I want. But if you approach an ATM and pick the lock from behind, because usually there is a lock from behind to open the case which the machine sits, it's not the, ca it's not the safe box with the money, but the case that the machine sits, uh, you can easily boot from a USB, 
CD, you can change the boot order, uh, and even if there is a password, we'll see it uh, uh, later on, even if there is a password, it's usually a very basic one or very known one, or you can just Google for it. Uh, yeah. So, of course, there is, uh, in addition, weak file integrity, so you know there is, uh, they're not checking anything. If you change something in the registry, if you edit some log files, if you uh, uh, even install malware, there's nothing that would detect it because it's it's very weak. It's like it's like hacking into a machine, I don't know, 10 years ago or something like that. Uh, yeah. So the data. So what happens in very old ATMs? You have like a, a a paper roll, and things are actually being written inside with a small printer on that paper roll. Uh, but in the newer ATMs, and when I'm saying newer, it's let's say ATMs that are 10 years old or something like that. Those ATMs might keep local files. Instead of printing them inside the machine, it will actually keep a local uh, logical file. And what happens is that once you have logical access, you can actually grab those files because they're just being kept there unencrypted. Uh, yeah. So this is an example of a tool called Card Recon. Uh, and a lot of uh, uh, PCI guys use that tool. And that tool is actually just scanning the machine or scanning a share or scanning a hard drive or a token or whatever. And it will uh, actually uh, show you where, in which files you have um, full PAN numbers or credit card numbers. So you can just take that tool or any other tool or you can write your own and scan uh, an ATM or scan a share and it will give you the uh, credit card numbers out of that ATM because usually they keep it there. It's funny to note, we, we had cases where this particular tool would crash because we find so many card numbers, like millions, with this buffer over, or just fucking crash. So we had to file a bug report to the company. Yeah, and that's from, from a single ATM. So yeah, so in one ATM, it's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, so as we said with hardening, there is pretty weak hardening. So what we did, uh, we saw that there is zero or no hardware integrity check. So for example, I would expect if I remove a hard drive, I remove something, uh, the machine should actually detect it. And if I plug my own hard drive, you know, remove the ATM hard drive, plug my own, let's say I place a malware there or something, the ATM should say, you know, I cannot boot from that hard drive or there is something wrong. But it seems that you can do whatever you want in those machines. You can replace everything, you can change everything. There's no integrity check in, in that matter. Uh, of course, you can uh, copy and steal data from the hard drive because there's nothing that will detect you and nothing that will prevent you from uh, uh, from doing it. And of course, escape the memory for goodies. So this is you know uh, stuff that you can see sometimes in memory. But of course, on an ATM, if you'll scrape the memory, uh, you probably see you will see full pen numbers. So you can just take the memory, put it in a file, then go back home. Uh, and actually check the memory and grab the uh, grab the full card numbers from from the ATM memory. Uh, now regarding credentials, so there is either no passwords or there are very known passwords. Like we saw on some ATMs, one two three four five six for the admin, uh, or we in some of them we actually had to Google a bit, and you can see that there is a lot of people that actually collecting those passwords, default password. So you can I don't know find default password for NCR, default password for WinCore, and you know usually uh, banks or ATM companies are pretty lazy. They will just keep it like that because it's also very complex to change. You know, let's say somebody revealed your password. Now, you know, good luck changing 2,000 or 10,000 ATMs passwords because you, you can't do it from remote, you know, like bias passwords and stuff like that. Another thing that we saw is that the operators that actually handle those machines, they have a user, let's say, in the Active Directory. Let's say the, the username is John. You can just uh, hack them in that way, and we'll see it later on, but you can just grab their password from, their AD, from the AD. That would probably be the same password on the ATM or vice versa. If you already pwned an ATM, you can probably extract John's local password and that would be the same password in his AD. So we saw a lot of those uh, things. So the patch, patch process. Uh, we've heard a lot of promises that uh, they do patch. Okay, what's that? They do patch, uh, but I don't think they do. What happens is that there is zero to none patching on those machines. So let's say they install them in, I don't know, 2001, then that's it. That's a machine from 2001, and that's it. Uh, another thing is actually uh, they're outsourcing the, the patching or the handling process to a third party. 
So that third party, you know, they might have just two or three technicians and 10,000 ATMs to handle. So they'll be probably kind of lazy or busy. You know, they will not be able to attend each and every of those ATMs. Uh, and of course, the operation. So as you can see, it's either often weak or no uh, with all of those. So author authorization, authentication, uh, security monitoring, security logging, they're doing nothing. So even if you're sitting there dealing with an ATM, unless you know, a cop would go by and see, he will ask you, know, what, what are you doing with that machine? I don't think they will be able to uh, monitor you from remote. Uh, so it, it, seems, you know, it seems crazy because it's such an important machine, but because banks and ATM companies think that uh, either people do not have enough knowledge to deal with ATMs, or people will just uh, be afraid, they, will just, they just keep it like that. So it's totally unsecure. Yeah, uh, well, like Yannif said, I mean, what, we just, uh, what he just said is actually what's out there. But of course, they will tell you that they have all these things. But when you check them, it's usually broken. Uh, so thinking about the ATM sort of ecosystem, uh, it's very complex. Because usually, uh, in most countries, there's a bunch of sort of entities that will have either logical or physical access to the AT ATM. Right? So if you want to hack an ATM, remember, you can, you can actually target one of these sort of entities to sort of go via them to pawn the ATM. And uh, here's a couple you can see on the slide. And uh, often it's even more than that. So uh, remember, all these sort of entities are uh, potential threats that, that could target the ATM and hack it for various reasons. Maybe to get the data that we talked about or gain access to it. Because uh, remember, once you control the ATM, you can actually use that to attack other ATMs on that, on that sort of uh, network or sort of share uh, infrastructure like, like the ATM switches or even the back end, right? So it's quite nice to, to uh, get hold of an ATM because that's a nice trusted little entity that you can use to attack other uh, parts of the organization. And uh, like we said before, there's always a heavy reliance on the sort of physical security the network uh, <laughs> isolation and that sort of stuff. But usually that's pretty, pretty uh, weak or broken, to be honest. Here's again a, a picture to show you um, uh, the typical sort of uh, job roles or entities that will have physical or logical access. And you can see it's a lot, right? And often there's also gray areas between these job roles. So one of them might think that the other is supposed to monitor something, or they might, might have, like Yannif said, outsourced to another party, but maybe they didn't specify exactly what they should do, and no one is checking that they're doing it, right? So there's usually all kinds of gaps. Um, Again, so all these sort of trust relationships to, to all these entities that manage or have physical access to the ATM span over like everything, like physical, logical processes, meatware, in other words, the people. And uh, so it's a huge attack for a surface, right? Um, and of course, uh, often there's some, like we keep saying, weak OPSEC that you can really sort of uh, punch through if you want to hack stuff. This is a stupid little picture. Um, so, uh, the sort of uh, methodology, how to pawn an ATM, it's actually nothing different from any sort of hacking, right? I mean, you'll do, do uh, your intelligence gathering. That's probably the most important step, like we talked about, because you can find out who has access. Uh, you can maybe find some credentials you can try. I mean, how are you going to attack uh, the sort of uh, ATM ecosystem, right? You'll think of some uh, weaknesses that you can try to uh, later uh, exploit, right? And then you plan your attack, you execute your stuff, and you do your damage. And then uh, that's, a, of course, an iterative process. You might have to get some more intelligence during your attack, plan again, execute, and go back like that, right? And then you uh, clean up and get the hell out. Um, so. Uh, Say you walk up to an ATM and want to hack it, right? So you want to gain physical access. Like we said before, um, you can uh, pick the lock. Usually, it's pretty crappy locks. Or you can even just buy the key like online on eBay or something. They're pretty cheap. You can just use a crowbar and, and sort of break it open. Or like we said before, uh, all those job roles that we showed, right? You can actually socially, social engineer one of them. And they might give you physical access or help you to get in there. Or you can actually, it takes a bit longer, of course, to go work for one of these entities uh, that has access. And once you have physical access, you can do things like put a, key, a hardware key logger there, leave it there, and then you can collect the credentials to break in, to actually log into the, the, the computer. Or you can put like, a, if you want to have remote access, you can put like a Dropbox and attach like a 3G modem, so you can remotely do stuff. And like I said before, uh, once you have sort of physical access, you can, you can start attacking other a ATMs to do whatever you want, right? And, and use silly things like uh, firewire attack to dump the, the memory or escalate your privilege. 
Um, also think how, how cheap it is, you know, like let's say the 3G modem option. So, you know, break the lock, either you buy a Kia TV for like $3, $4, or just buy a set of picks and open it because it's a very simple lock. Then the 3G model is like, what, 20, 30 euros and another SIM card with data, let's say with 20 gigabytes of data, that's another 20, 30 euros. So in, let's say in 50 euros, you can sort of uh, put a bug inside an ATM and control it from remote. So. Yeah, and and we, we saw it happen. So. Uh, yeah, and these attacks definitely are happening. You can read the newspaper almost every week, someone doing that sort of thing. They're breaking in, putting some stuff. Most of them are not that clever, though, because they get caught, you know, but uh, that's another funny one, I thought. Um, put your pin and then press this key, but um, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. So, uh, authentication, we talked already about that. Usually, there's nothing fancy like smart card or something cool like that. It's usually uh, very weak or stupid passwords. So either you can Google for it or you can even uh, speak to the technician. That's probably the best way to just find the technician and just speak to him, and he will probably tell you. Then you get the sort of the back door, right? And we already talked about hardware key loggers and social engineering. And part. also in smart cards, you know, when I walk to, to the teller in my bank, usually they have smart cards, you know, they, when they go up, you know, when they move from their computer, they will take it with them. So, yes, their actual, their, their endpoint is extremely secure. But, you know, if you go back to the ATM, that could do a lot of harm in the organization. That's totally the opposite. So it's not just passwords, it's extremely weak passwords. So it seems that the banks are thinking that if their employees are using smart cards and you know, RFID tags and all of that, everything is secured, but it's, it's just wrong. So. Um, yeah, again, what we said, I mean, uh, it turns into regular pen tests. You can use whatever exploits you need, whatever, to pawn all that sort of uh, old stuff or, you know, PS tools, do some old school DLL code injection, firewire. Also, those things like firewire is like what, 10 years old? Exactly, firewire it's really tech. old stuff, man. And then uh, PS tools, I'm not sure how old it is, but you can easily get privilege escalation yeah. uh, to system. And of course, exploits, you know, it's ridiculous to, you don't need like the coolest zero days or something like that. You can just use, you know, old exploits from ExploitDB or Metasploit or something like that because the things are so old in there. Yeah. yeah. And make sure to bring, if you're going to have hardware key loggers, bring your PS2 because a lot of them don't have USB, obviously. It's like old stuff. Um, yeah. Then uh, the data stuff, uh, like, yeah, we talked about that already. Scan for uh, car data, not only pads, actually, also full track data, so you can actually clone the card if you want. Um, yeah, so detection bypass, so what we saw with, uh, with the alarms, you know, we, we did a test. Uh, specific company somewhere in Europe, and they had a nice sticker on the ATM that says, you know, if you touch it or if you open it or something, there will be an alarm and, we, you know, the cups will come and blah, blah, blah. So uh, because we were testing it, we actually asked, you know, to try it, to open that ATM and see if, if any alarm will happen and if the cups will show up and all of that. And then the guy that worked with us t told us from that company, from that bank, told us, okay, let me just check with the team that monitors the alarm that they're ready to see that you're opening that ATM. <laughs> and, and then we told him, okay, go ahead. And he went for like half an hour or 40 minutes or something. And then when he came back, he told us, uh, you know what, there is no team to monitor the alarm. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. <coughs> then we said, okay, never mind. If, you know, let us just try the alarm as is. And then we actually opened the box and there is no alarm. So what happened, it's all fake. There is no team, there is no cops that will show up. There is no alarm. It's just a sticker to frighten you that there is something there. So this is just one of the things we, we saw. Yeah, saw of course, that also goes to the weak and no monitoring. Nobody cared. We opened, we, you know, we opened ATMs all over the world. Nobody cares. Nobody will show up. So unless you're very unlucky, you know, yeah. or it's a very secure, specific secure ATM, but from what we saw, most of them are just, just like that. Yeah, I mean, another thing yeah. is like, remember, usually there's, it looks like there's a camera in the ATM, but remember, some uh, countries have quite strict privacy legislation, right? So it should be working, right? But often it's turned off because they're not allowed to actually record. So uh, again, it's sort of, it's supposed to work and be there, but it's not working at all, actually. Yeah, and then, uh, well, of course, AV, we talked about it, very old engine, so they might update the signatures, but the engines are very old. So if you use even the crappiest packers, or if you just open the file and do some hex changes in the exact place when the AV is detecting that file, you can easily bypass the AV. IDS and IPS, 
as we saw, there's either nothing or very old and unknown ones, so it's almost not there. And regarding Tripwire, we saw that they're really trying to push, put Tripwire on a lot of ATMs, so I'm not sure if all of you are familiar, Tripwire is sort of a, a tool to monitor stuff. There is different templates. You can pick a template, and then it will mo monitor specific stuff on that uh, machine, and then if it, you know, something is bad happening, something bad is happening, it will send uh, an alert to a SimSock team or something like that. Uh, so I would say Tripwire is a pretty good tool. The thing is the way they implement it on some of the ATMs makes, makes it totally useless to protect against hackers. It could protect against, uh, I don't know, a technician that tries to steal some money from the uh, $20 bill car cartridge or something like that, but it will not protect against hackers because it's configured totally wrong. Yeah, and uh, remember, uh, you may have some sort of detection, right? But then that's not enough, because once you detect something, you have to respond and do some, something about it, right? And that's even worse, because usually there's no response at all, like we said, right? Or it's quite weak. So uh, another thing, they never verify these things. So they claim to have this and that, and, and uh, usually it's, like we keep saying, broken or not working at all, actually. And, uh, okay, so network attacks. So remember, some of these ATMs are actually managed sort of over the network, so they might have some operators who sit somewhere uh, to do stuff uh, from their desktop. So of course, that's uh, uh, a nice uh, sort of target if you want to uh, hack these ATMs. You go for the operators and pawn their desktop, and then you sort of get their access to everything, right? And uh, we already talked about, uh, again, attacking other parts of the whole sort of uh, networks and backend and that sort of thing. And uh, we already talked about this again, but that's probably one of the best ones. I mean, really figure out in your intelligence gathering what job roles have access. And then you just do your social engineering on these people, and then you can get some really, actually really nice one is actually other white hats or, or security testing farms, because or uh, they might do code reviews on the application and stuff like that. So if you pwn their email, for instance, you can read uh, their email, and often there they bounce around uh, where the uh, repositories are for the code or even credentials. That way you can, uh, and also read the reports, and then you, you don't have to look for the vulnerabilities. You'll just have them, and then you can exploit them, right? So that's a really good one. And another one regarding security guards, for example. So uh, we're, we're usually speaking English. So we were doing a test in a non-English country, non-English speaking country. You know, they don't learn it at school and so on. And we actually stayed there pretty late at like, I don't know, nine or something. And then a security guard approached us, you know, to see what, because he was sort of patrolling the area to see if somebody's doing anything. And then he asked us in his, in his language, you know, probably what are you doing here? But we just replied in English. And because he couldn't communicate with us, he just said, uh, okay, and left. <laughs> so, so this is a nice trick against security guards. Just yeah. use a different language and they will just say, screw that. And there's another really funny one actually, uh, where he did speak English, but not very good. So he almost felt like a bit embarrassed to speak. But he would answer every question. So I was there like uh, another one of these kind of late at night. I didn't wear my badge or anything. And he answered every question. I, I just asked questions about the whole alarm system and all this sort of stuff. And he gave all the information, right? So I mean, it's, it's usually pretty bad. OK, so that's how uh, let's do it, how to pawn an ATM. So those are the general uh, uh, steps. So obtain Intel, that's what we gave you in those slides, how an ATM is built, and what apps are in there, and OS, and all of that. So, I assume you can take it from here. Uh, of course, best to be stealthy. So yes, we said that they're not monitoring and the, the AV is crap and the IPS is crap and everything, but still you need to keep some sort of level of you know, being quiet, not, don't make too much noise with you know, crazy stuff. Uh, and then of course, work smart with social engineering. So don't approach each and every guy working in that bank, start asking questions because they will get the point that, you know, sometimes. So just don't make too much noise. Now, general tips, and I think this is a very important slide because we had a lot of issues, and I think those are nice tips. So a single reboot of an average ATM in Europe is 20 minutes. So just think about, let's say you, you wrote a piece of code. You want to see if it's working. You installed it on that Windows XP machine, on this Windows XP ATM. Now you want to reboot it. It will take 20 minutes. That means that the ATM will not be available for 20 minutes. Now, I don't think the banks would care, but if a customer approaches an ATM, he wants to withdraw money, he used to withdraw money every day from that specific ATM, now he sees that the ATM, ATM is down, he might call the bank or might call the ATM company and tell them, listen, what's going on? And remember, sometimes uh, when you're writing code, it's not, it's not perfect, so you need to reboot twice or three times or four times, so just imagine, you can sit 
for two hours next to that ATM just to see if a piece of code is working, a piece of malware that you installed. So be very careful. Probably if you're going to reboot it, do it at night, you know, or something like that when there's not a lot of people. Uh, well, as, as we know, there's lack of proper testing on ATMs. So we, mostly the banks just tell us, you know, it's, it's an ATM. Nobody knows how to hack it. Hackers do not mess with ATMs. Uh, yes, there are some, you know, criminals that will blow it or stuff like that. But hackers, they, they don't care about ATMs. Uh, so, of course, they're not fixing it, fixing it in the logical level. Um, of course, there is silo. So in big corporations, you know, people care only about their own position. They don't care about the company. So let's say that there is this guy, he's in charge on the physical security of, of the ATM. And then there is another guy in a different department. He's in charge on the logical part. If they will not work together, there will be gaps between the physical and logical layers that we can use. And from what we saw, people do does not like to, to work together in those, uh, in those places. So there is a lot of gaps between things. You know, one guy is in charge of the OS security. There is another guy in charge of the application security. And you know, there is a big mess with those ATMs. Uh, and of course, build a good threat modeling or good attack tree. You know, before you're going to attack an ATM, learn it and know exactly what's going on with it before you actually execute something. And I would also argue with the customer. If they say you can only touch the um, an application or something, try to have a much wider scope because that's how the real attacks work. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so we actually covered a lot of this already, like you break stuff and uh, one funny thing is, um, of course, there's still these sort of uh, old school attacks where they, they put like silicone to seal all the cracks so that it's airtight and then they blow it up with a gasoline bomb, right? Or they smash the ATM with a tractor or something, pull it out. Uh, so this is South Africa, where they blow up uh, ATMs a lot. Um, here again, we already talked actually about this, right? So uh, if you want to pwn uh, an ATM over the network, target actually the, the operators have, who have such access, right? Uh, same here, we talked about the, the developers. Um, maybe you can go ahead, you can talk about that. Maybe. Yeah. So the central, uh, central update service. So it's the same thing, you know, instead of attacking a the ATM directly, you can attack an update server that updates the ATM and then put some malware in there. So that malware will be shoved into your uh, ATM. And from what we saw, almost nothing is encrypted while using ATMs. Well, the, actually the transaction, you know, when you, when you put your card and, and ask for some money, that transaction would be probably encrypted in most ATMs. But the rest, you know, like updates and the actual hard drive that stores the data will be unencrypted. So it's pretty easy if you cannot have direct access to the ATM, just shove some updates with your stuff and then you could access directly to the, there, you can access directly to the ATM. Of course, sysadmins, that's the same thing. Uh, where was that? California? Uh, I think it's San Francisco. San Francisco. That's... Okay, so we try to take uh, our experience and build some sort of a story how to, how to uh, hack into an ATM. The bad thing is that we cannot show you actual proofs because then some companies will sue us and we don't want to do it. Uh, we don't want it to happen. Uh, but the thing is, our mindset when hacking an ATM is not the money in the ATM because usually you have, I don't know, let's say $100,000 in that ATM, so yes, you can either hack it or just blow it up with some guns or gas or something and just steal the money. But what we're thinking as hackers is it's pretty good to sort of sit as a leech on that ATM. And once you control that ATM, you can either attack uh, into the organization deeper into the mainframe and so on because that ATM is connected to a lot of places. And the thing is, from what we saw, banks are not suspecting their own ATMs attacking them. So even in the bank's internal network, there is not a lot of protection from that sort of scans the communication from the ATM to the bank. So that's the story that we uh, try to build. So of course, this is the physical part. Uh, an easiest way will be just to go to a, a standing uh, ATM, like in 7-Eleven or something, not, not a hole in the wall, not like inside a bank. Uh, but just a, a standalone ATM. And there's usually a lock behind it. Just pick it very easily. It's extremely easy to pick those locks. Then you will get access to, actual, to the actual machine. Once you get access to the actual machine, then you can move to the logical part. Uh, of course, 
if you need a BIOS password, just Google it. So if it's NCR, just Google NCR, default BIOS password. If it's Dbold, Dbold, default BIOS password. You can find those uh, uh, passwords. I think we saw them in a lot of Asian websites. I'm not sure why, yeah. but it's kind of. It's funny. Sometimes uh, we'd find like the password, like, I don't know, some I don't know, Indonesian manual or something, but it would work like in, that, in the country where we were. So exactly. it might leak like in other places. Um, so this is one phase. So about the alarm, as we said, there is no alarm from what we saw. And of course, it could be off. Uh, or you can, if it's on, it's unencrypted packet. So actually, the ATM sends a certain packet to a control room, says, you know, something is wrong with me. You can just capture that packet or disconnect the ATM cable for a few seconds or something. And then, res you know, resend your own packet that will say, yeah, everything is OK. Of course, you need to learn. Uh, what packets to send. That's why you need to do the monitoring you had. You need to monitor the ATM communication, see what kind of packets the ATM sends every now and then. Uh, yeah, so this is the logical part. This is sort of, so we have the physical part. This is one logical branch. So what we can do is actually take the hard drive, duplicate it, and then use it later. Now, what, what can we do with the hard drive? First, we can just duplicate it and Insert, uh, uh, insert the original hard drive with, with our own malware or with our own backdoor and control that ATM. And then do transactions, you know, from the ATM, force the mainframe to do a transaction of, I don't know, a million dollars to our account or to a fake account or something. So it's way more than the actual cash in the machine that we don't care about. Uh, then what we can do is actually look for vulnerabilities on the actual app because uh, as we said, they're not investing a lot of effort in security. So in some countries, the app that you will see on the screen is just a simple web app. So you have like Windows XP with IS, I don't know, IS5, and then some websites serving you. That's it. That's the ATM. Uh, so of course, you can also put the 3G modem with the SIM card. We talked about it. You can just put it in there and then control that ATM from remote. So you don't need any cables going to it. That's a different branch. So if we don't want to make a lot of noise, because if you take the hard drive out, as we said, it's going to take at least 20 minutes to boot it out. So it takes, uh, I don't know, a minute to take it out, then 20 minutes of boot, and it takes you a minute to put it in. That's like 22 minutes that the ATM is down. And that's if it went you well on the first try. If it's going to you know, take three tries, that's 66 minutes when the ATM is down. So that's a different branch, how to do it without taking the ATM down. So uh, what we're saying is that bypass the AV, very simple, you know, there is very known uh, ways to bypass AVs and because the engines are so old, you can look at methods from 2005 and use them. And then of course you need to collect some information. What is the exact OS? I would say 90% 90, 90 it's Windows XP unpatched, maybe without any service specs or anything. Uh, and of course, you need to check the patch level, the OS, the, the application, so on. So collect some information. So you will be, you, you will, you could approach that ATM again when you're prepared with the right exploits and the right tools. Uh, then, of course, now we know, you know, now we get access to the ATM because we picked the lock. Uh, we know what OS it's running because we already checked. We know what kind of apps is running in there. We know that security is crap. We know that usually the alarm is just a fake thing. It's not really working. So what we need to do is just take it all together and hack it like an old machine. That's it. So it's not an, a special ATM. Now you don't need to be uh, special hackers or something. It's just hacking like a very old machine. Uh, well, now that you, that's what we said, you can just penetrate deeper into the organization. Because what happens, banks are usually, ATMs are in their trusted networks. So it's not like. A, you know, I would expect that it will be in some sort of a DMZ or something. They will not trust those machines because, you know, they're not physically in their place. They're all over the country, spread it. So who knows what people are doing with them? So I would expect they will be in a DMZ. But from what we saw, they are pretty trusted machines. So you can get anywhere. You can go through different VLANs. You can go, you know, even connect directly to the mainframe from an ATM. So that's that's crazy. Yeah. yeah, so it's how to fix these things. Like we said before, you just have to, it's just hard security work. I mean, you have to put prevention, detection, and response in place. And of course, make sure that this stuff works. So once in a while, actually verify that these things are working because there seems to be a lot of uh, trust and stuff that's actually not, never verified. So that's very important. Here's some other funny stuff. And yeah. 
So to wrap up some of the things we talked about, it's all the complex stuff. Uh, there's a lot of security about obscurity. Uh, you should test properly and have a good scope when you test, right? And what we said, evaluate them and fix these things. And uh, make sure that you don't have these silo problems. It's a big problem, as we see, when they scope these sort of pen tests. They only want to look at one little thing. I think it's, it's sort of like, you know, it's very similar to hacking mainframes and hacking SCADA, hacking ATMs, because the, what, what, you know, the sort of the official people, the CISOs and the security managers assume is that uh, people do not have access to those things or it's so, you know, very expensive. So they don't know how to hack it. They don't know what's going on in there. And as you can see, mainframes these days are pretty easy to hack and there are some big incidents. SCADA is becoming very, you know, there's tons of people hacking different SCADA stuff. And I would say ATM is the third in line because it's, again, a lot of people do not know what's going on in there, but once you know, it's extremely easy to hack. Yeah, and the focus yeah. is usually on the cash part, not the sort of things we've been talking about. That's it. Yeah, any questions? Yeah. Just a second, please. Um, okay, so my question is, if it's really that bad, if you know any company who is properly set up and the security is in place, or all the companies you know are, you know, containing threats? Well, it could be that there are some companies that are secure, but from our experience, we tested different ATMs in different countries, and we saw the same scenario. So from what we saw, we haven't saw any secure ATM, right? Not really, no. Yeah. I mean, so. I mean, you can't, I mean, nothing is absolute, but I think these are kind of the general trends. I mean, it's pretty crap, to be honest, and uh, that's the way it is. But again, remember, it's a business decision. Some of these companies, uh, uh, once we, we even did our testing, they, they will sort of accept the risk and say, okay, we'll, we'll just live with that, and there you go. I mean, all we can do is sort of show them, right, so they can make that decision, but um, it, it's pretty bad, I would say, in general. And if anybody knows a secure ATM, if you can approach us and point it out, that would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry? No, no not in Poland. Not yet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, we, we will be happy to check if you can, if you can help us, you know, arrange, arrange an ATM or something. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thank okay, you. so thank you. thank you very much. Big applause, please. Yeah.